what Harold has to say, so I will let Professor Jenny Martinez introduce him. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks. So as Clarette said, Harold really needs no introduction, but uh, just by way of background, he is a professor of international law at Yale Law School, was the dean there from 2009 to two uh, from 2004 to 2009, and then from 2009 to 2013 was the legal advisor at the U.S. State Department, uh, probably the most distinguished scholar and practitioner of international law in, in the United States, if not the world. We're very grateful that he's taken time to come over here to the law school uh, to talk. He'll also be giving a talk across campus in Building 200 in the Quad, sponsored by the program in global health and human rights and the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law on tobacco control and human rights. So I would encourage you all to go over to the 5.30 talk as well. Um, his topic now will be international law as smart power. And with that, I will turn it over to Harold. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. And um, every time I come here, I wonder why I don't come here more often. Uh, let me say thank you to my uh, host, but particularly to Jenny, who's been a friend of mine now for a long time. And um, you're very lucky to have her as your professor. Uh, and uh, it's a great subject, international law. So it, what I'm going to try to do, most of all, is explain to you why this is the best time ever to study international law. But <clears throat> it'll take a while to get there. So as Jenny explained, I spent my last 30 years um, as an international law professor, five years as a dean, about 20 years as a human rights lawyer, and 10 years in the US government. Uh, I spent a couple of years in the Justice Department in the 80s, um, in the Human Rights Bureau at the State Department as a policymaker in the 90s, and then the last four years as legal advisor at the State Department in the 21st century. Just to give you a sense of some of the things I did, uh, the top left-hand corner uh, presenting our case to the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, and the top right is at the Kremlin for the nuclear security talks with the Russians, bottom left uh, uh, in uh, Afghanistan, bottom right, uh, Guantanamo, where I've gone pretty much every year since 1991. Um, I've been there really, I think I've, I've worked on Guantanamo issues on my birthday for something like 19 of the last 23 years. Uh, undisclosed military location on the left-hand side, the center of the Parthenon, working on the Greek financial crisis. Uh, far right, going with former Secretary Albright to the funeral of uh, Kim Dae-jung of Korea. Uh, and I appeared in many courts uh, for the United States in the International Court of Justice in the Kosovo case, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, the African Court of Human and People's Rights, and as the co-leader of the U.S. delegation to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. And I took many flights. This is the most famous <laughs> by far. This is uh, uh, now the logo of tweets from uh, Hillary. Uh, we were actually in Malta. Um, and uh, which is a little island off the coast of Italy. <coughs> and we were flying into Libya uh, after the fall of Gaddafi. And we we're on a military transport plane. And because the secretary was on the plane, they gave four nice seats. And I was the second ranking guy in the plane, so I sat behind her. Then everybody got on the plane, started taking pictures of us. And so I actually texted to her, look over your shoulder. So that's what she's reading here. Uh, <laughs> And um, anyway, all these people, my mother, of course, says to me, who is the woman sitting in front of you in the picture in which you're on the airplane? She, she likes it. <laughs> and I worked on uh, many issues, uh, uh, WikiLeaks, um, the earthquake in Haiti, the Fukushima nuclear reactor in Japan, of course, issues relating to Arab awakening, human rights, uh, the pictures of Chen Guangchen, the blind Chinese activist, who we got out of the embassy in Beijing. I spent uh, 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 10 days there sleeping in the embassy. Various international criminal courts, uh, cyberspace, 
uh, economic and private international law, environmental issues, global warming, public health. Uh, and it's public health that I'll be talking about this afternoon in the tobacco control speech I'm giving at 5.30, which is about just a piece of this. But <clears throat> the most challenging issues concern the fallout of 9-11, which is now more than 12 years ago. So um, let me just say that there are some givens about government service that are worth considering. The first is that you're not the only lawyer. Uh, I was the lead lawyer at the State Department for a law firm of about 200 lawyers, 400 people. But guess how many lawyers there are in the Defense Department? We had 200. Try 17,000. 17,000, you know, 12,000 lawyers in the Justice Department, Homeland Security, Treasury, CIA, Director of National Intelligence, NSA. Do they have lawyers there? The National Security Council. <laughs> um, U.S. Trade Representative. So one of the remarkable things is that um, you're able to reach legal positions at all. Um, in that those offices have to all clear on anything that comes out of the government. If something comes out as a government position, it means that all legal offices of interest have signed off. And that's not easy. So uh, a classic kind of criticism that you hear is the government issued some kind of legal statement, but it didn't answer the hard questions. People say this. I mean, this is comical. That, that's the exact point where they stopped agreeing, and they couldn't get a clearance. So they stopped where there was consensus. So of course they didn't answer the hard questions. And if they didn't have to answer the hard questions, they save it until that question is actually posed. A second, and also, pretty clear point is you're not your own client. You know, when you're a professor, you can just say whatever you think. You don't have to check with anybody. If you're the lawyer for Hillary Clinton, you know, she's a pretty smart lawyer. And if she actually works for Barack Obama, he's no slouch either. The question is not what do you think is the best legal position. The question is, is what they want to do lawful? Now, obviously, you can't tell them that something that's unlawful, like torture, is lawful. But if they have a range of legal options, you can say what you think is the best option. But if they say, we want to do something different, you advise them, is it legally available or not? Which means that there's a category of um, issues that we call lawful but awful, namely, um, would that be my preferred position? No. Is it legally available to you? Yes. If that's what you want to choose, I'll argue against it as a matter of policy. But if you want to choose it because you were elected by the people and I wasn't, that's what our Constitution permits. Third, you have many roles about which I'll say more. And fourth, and, oh, I should say a word about precedent. Um, you know, I've written a lot in my life. I've written eight books, 180 plus articles. But guess what? When my office was reviewing issues, they did not look to a footnote in an article that I wrote when I was 27 years old coming up for tenure. They looked at the precedence of the office of the legal advisor of the State Department. So, I mean, what I said is interesting in the way that any academic piece is interesting. But, you know, in the blog world, there's a game that goes on, which is, so-and-so said this today, 20 years ago they said this, so obviously they've changed their views, you know. Now, these are invariably presented without nuance at all, and usually the person hasn't even read the article or whatever it is, put it in context. But the fact of the matter is, um, you know, if it was up to me, I'd say trust the positions that I take after being in practice for 30 years in positions that are cleared with you know, 50,000 other lawyers on matters of life and death over something I threw to complete a tenure piece when I was 27 years old and knew nothing about the world. Now, this is a shocking statement, <laughs> but uh, um, it's something I urge you to think about. Um, finally, um, there is a story about two guys uh, who are walking down the road 
they're from uh, Galway. And one guy says to the other, how do you get to Dublin from here? And he says, you know, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> well, you, know, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, you don't get to choose, you know. Um, if you get a chance to serve in the government, you take the cards you're dealt. So would I have preferred to serve in peacetime uh, with a vibrant economy and no political fighting? Yeah, sure. But you don't have that choice. You play the hand you're dealt. So uh, with that, my role in the legal advisor's office, I was the managing partner of a big law firm. I think the best international law firm in the world. I uh, ha had four deputies, a counselor, 24 legal offices with assistant legal advisors. Um, <clears throat> and so it was an interesting management job. Uh, I was the counsel in the sense I was a general counsel to um, our foreign affairs ministry. Um, and general counsel do many different things. You know, general counsel of Microsoft does similar kinds of things. You know, you buy a building, but they're in Kabul, they're not in Cupertino. Uh, or you get visas, but they're in Pakistan. Um, you manage conflicts among many parts of the State Department, which is a very far-flung organization. I think the special role of the legal advisor at the State Department is that you are the spokesperson or conscience of the government on international law. People expect you to state the government's legal position. And a lot of what I tried to do was, if we had an international legal position, to try to put it out there not because I thought people would agree with it, but because I thought there should be a place where it was definitively stated. And then, um, if your position is challenged, you defend. After all, you are the official spokesperson on international law, so if someone says what you're doing is illegal, you defend it. Um, it's um, like that scene in, um, what, what is it, Iron Man 1. <laughs> where Gwyneth Paltrow says to, to uh, Robert Downey Jr., one of my favorites, uh, I don't have anybody but you, right? <laughs> if you're the defender, uh, you have to defend the position if you think it's lawful. If you're not prepared to defend the position, you should quit. Um, and since you presumably developed the position, you ought to be able to be an articulate spokesperson for it. So this means that you can, over your lifetime, uh, play many roles but have the exact same commitments. Just to give you an example, if you do criminal law, you could, over the course of a 30-year career, be a public defender, you could be a prosecutor, you could be a professor of criminal law, you could be a judge. You're always dealing with the same substantive body of law, but you're going to emphasize different pieces of that body of law depending on what role you play. So I consider myself a man of peace. I'm a professor of international law. I feel I'm a defender of human rights. And for the three, four years, I was a lawyer for a nation at war. Why do I say this? Because I was often asked, um, you opposed torture. You said it was, it was wrong and illegal. You've offered a legal defense of drones. Isn't that inconsistent? The answer is, of course it's not. All torture is illegal. No matter for what purpose or how it's used, the president may not be the torturer in chief. Uh, all killing is not illegal. If you study the laws of war, the very purpose of the laws of war is to draw the line between lawful and unlawful killing. And it is the duty of government lawyers, in fact, if you don't want to do it, you shouldn't be a government lawyer, to draw the line between uses of force that are lawful or not, and uses of force that save lives or not. So it's hard for a human rights lawyer to be supportive of killing Osama bin Laden as a matter of law or policy. But on the other hand, I think everyone agrees he's a guy who killed 3,000 innocent civilians in only one of many attacks. So you have to draw difficult lines. And that's one of the difficult things about being an international lawyer. Now, 9-11 <clears throat> clearly changed our lives. It was a grotesque human rights violation. More than that, it was a new kind of war. It demanded a response that was respectful of law and human rights, and that's been captured in a new blog called Just Security, for which I'm one of the editors. In other words, our goal is not just security, but just security. And the question is, did it inaugurate a phase, or did it permanently change the landscape into a new normal? It triggered a post-9-11 
post-Cold War era, uh, it was part of what Tom Friedman would call a flat world of globalization, where there are many threats and decision makers and actors. And um, it transpired amid a toxic political environment, the worst of my lifetime. So against this background, the question is, do we have a global strategy to adapt 20th century law to solve 21st century justice problems? I found over and over and over again that when you step back from any particular issue, that was the question. 21st century problems, 20th century law. Now, why do I put it that way? My first day of work, my first day of work, I, I had a little game I played with myself which is how early in the day would a problem come along that I would use in an exam question? And it was always before 10 a.m. So my very first day of work at about 8 a.m., someone comes in and goes, you know, Harold, um, a frozen embryo of a panda belonging to a large Asian nation has been stopped at customs, and the question is, is it protected by the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. <laughs> it occurred to me that the framers of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act in 1976 had not thought of this question. Um, or if you think that, how about this? If some guy who looks like Jack Black sitting at a computer screen hits a key that sends a signal that disrupts a server on the other side of the world that may end up either bringing down a terrorist network or disrupting the operation of a hospital, is that or is that not subject to the laws of war? Well, guess what? I don't know, you have to give me more facts to decide the legality of it, but the fact of the matter is that this is not something that the framers of the Geneva Convention thought about. And when we talk about 20th century law, much of our treaty law was made post-World War II uh, much of our national security law was made post-Vietnam and Watergate. Congress has a demonstrated incapacity to adopt law. They don't approve treaties pretty much anymore. They don't pass legislation except through appropriations. So we have an unchanging text and incredibly rapidly changing situations. So the question is, what do you do about this? And let me suggest that there are two possible models. One I call black hole. Pretty simple. The Geneva Conventions didn't think about this. They are quaint, to coin a phrase. Um, this is kind of a Tina Turner moment. What's law got to do with it? You know, what's law but a sweet old-fashioned notion? We can do whatever we will want. I would argue that was an approach that characterized the last administration. Black hole. They didn't think about Guantanamo, so on Guantanamo, there must be no law. What's the alternative? Uh, it's what Montesquieu would call the spirit of the laws, or what I would call translation. In other words, there's a framework of law there. There are norms, animating norms. They don't map perfectly onto the current set of facts. But how do you translate, for example, the laws of war, jus ad bellum and jus in bello, to drones or to cyberspace? Can you do it in a way that's true to the object and purpose of these laws? <coughs> now, <clears throat> for those who would say there is no difference between the Obama approach to 9-11 and the Bush administration, I say, oh yeah? The Bush administration approach is black hole. The Obama approach is primarily translation. And there's a world of difference between saying there's no law to apply and saying we're trying to apply the rules to novel situations. You should debate those rules, but you're acknowledging that law governs these practices. So there's a very important philosophical difference. And then the question is, is this part of the strategy? And the answer is very simple. International law as smart power. So people will debate. Does Obama have a coherent foreign policy? Is there an Obama doctrine? Whether he's successful in the implementation, I think it's pretty clear, yes. The driving philosophy is international law as smart power. And I hope that's what you take away from this. Now, more fundamentally, I would say this. This means three things, engage, translate, and leverage. 
when in doubt, engage around values. When in doubt, translate and apply the spirit of the laws, not a black hole. And law is a tool, but it's only one of many tools. It's combined with other tools to produce policy. That includes hard power, military force, but also diplomacy, development, technology, markets, and international institutions. So when in doubt, engage. When in doubt, translate. When in doubt, leverage. And the combination is a smart power approach in which international law is one of your assets. Now, I would contrast that to that of the last administration, which did not engage. It used largely a unilateralist approach. It did not translate. It used largely a black hole approach. It went it alone rather than trying to leverage. And it faced a situation of imperial overstretch. Now, I'm going to make a bold claim here. I don't just think that this is the philosophy of this administration. I think it's going to be the philosophy of every US administration going forward. If you've read Paul Kennedy's Decline and Fall of the Great Powers, you know what happens to people who try to dominate with hard power. What happens? They become militarily overstretched. They become economically overstretched. They become indebted. They can't maintain their position. And other people take their place. A smart power approach is both reaffirming of legitimacy, allows you to use uh, a concrete or discrete set of resources to lead, but your main form of leadership is leadership through law, not leadership through power. Now, where did this come from? I use this slide primarily to just show you how tough it is to be president. Look at Obama. <laughs> Look at Obama now and then. He looks like a kid, right? But he signaled this in his uh, inauguration speech. This was at the convention. A new era of engagement has begun. Living our values doesn't make us weaker, makes us safer and stronger. Engage around our values. And then Hillary Clinton, um, US foreign policy should use smart power, the full range of tools at our disposal, including defense, diplomacy, development, respect for law, human rights, public private partnership. Now, when she said this, people thought it was a slogan. They didn't think it had content. If you look on Google, Hillary Clinton and smart power, you will find dozens of speeches that she gave during her time as Secretary of State. Smart power and gender-based violence, smart power and public-private partnerships, smart power and 9-11, smart power and uh, economic statecraft. It is the driving theme of her time as Secretary of State, and were she to hold office again, presumably it would continue to be the driving uh, philosophy. Now, I can give a million examples, but let me just pick four so that we can throw it open to questions. One is uh, human rights engagement. This is the Human Rights Center on a range of issues. Another, international criminal justice. A third, assisted reproductive technologies. And a fourth, 21st century war, <coughs> which is very different from 19th century war. It involves cyberspace, private security contractors, drones, humanitarian intervention, and the like. So on engagement, it's clear, as I pointed out, that uh, we have entered a period where it's very difficult to get treaties. Uh, the Disability Convention only got 61 votes. The CEDAW Convention, Convention for Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, um, uh, will not get a vote anytime soon. Tobacco control, which I'm discussing later today, should be a vote. There are 177 parties to the Framework Convention. The United States is not one of them. Convention on the Rights of the Child, the United States is the only country that hasn't ratified except for Somalia. Then Somalia actually developed, their explanation was they had no organized government, now they have one. They're moving to ratify, leaving the United States alone, except that we now have southern Sudan. <laughs> and they haven't gotten their act together to ratify, and now there's turmoil there. So the United States will not be alone. <laughs> I'm just trying to find a silver lining here, guys. Now, <laughs> one philosophy is that there are international law positions, and they are a little bit below the radar screen. And um, one thing we tried to do when I was legal advisor was to put people who believe in international law as smart power into these slots. Jim Cavallaro, your faculty member at the uh, Inter-American Human Rights Commission, Joan Donahue uh, to the International Court of Justice, Jerry Newman, to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Carlos Vasquez to the Race Discrimination Committee, Sean Murphy to the International Law Commission, Sarah Cleveland of Columbia to the Venice Commission, 
Ted Moran as president of the Mechanism for the International uh, Criminal Tribunal. Why do we do this? For the simple reason, and Secretary Clinton and I discussed this, that long after we're both gone, they will still be there engaging around our values, and they are. Now, <clears throat> another was engagement with private public partnerships. One of Hillary Clinton's major initiatives was the so-called Quadrennial Development and Diplomacy Review, which combined diplomacy and aid to use private initiatives like multi-stakeholder initiatives, the Kimberley process, uh, the extractives, and internet governance as leverage. So let's take Burma. When we came into office, you know, Aung San Suu Kyi was under house arrest. Um, the strategy was pretty simple. You, you could have done nothing. We decided to engage with both the Burmese regime and with Aung San Suu Kyi. There had been a strategy of imposing sanctions bit by bit. We translated that into the opposite, easing sanctions action for action, and then monitoring corporate conduct, leveraged this into rule of law and human rights. And the net result is Aung San Suu Kyi is now a member of the Burmese parliament and the president or the head of the Parliamentary and Rule of Law Committee. Or how about this, LGBT rights. Hillary Clinton went to Geneva at the Human Rights Council. By the way, the last administration wasn't even a member of the Human Rights Council. They thought it was a bad idea. Uh, we re-engaged, that's engage. And when the question was what kind of speech should she give in 2011, she could have not gone. And what she said quite simply was this, LGBT rights are human rights and human rights are LGBT rights. That is a pure translation exercise. The whole apparatus of human rights now encompasses and protects LGBT. And where did this come from? 15 years earlier, she said the exact same thing at the Beijing Women's Conference. Women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. Then the leverage combined it with a bunch of domestic initiatives, elimination of don't ask, don't tell in the military, giving same-sex benefits, uh, opposing the constitutionality of DOMA, marriage equality briefs at the US Supreme Court, and you have a very dramatic turnaround <coughs> on uh, the government's relationship with LGBT individuals and couples. Or how about Chen Guanchen? Here's a guy who is a well-known dissident. He was in his home in Shandong, essentially under house arrest. I was in China, he escapes, breaks his foot, gets to the outskirts of Beijing, calls and asks to come to the embassy. We had a choice, we could have said, don't come in, <coughs> stay out, we're not gonna get into trouble with the Chinese. We engaged around our values. Part of the issue was one of translation. How do we let him into our embassy without creating a legal right for anyone to enter our embassy? which, by the way, would have affected everyone from Julian Assange to um, Cardinal Mincenti, who was in our embassy for 17 years in Hungary. And my conclusion was that there was nothing to forbid the US as a matter of law from admitting someone temporarily to their embassy for the purpose of medical care, which also happened to be a fact-specific determination. And then working with a private institution, New York University, we leveraged this engagement and translation into a setting where he could continue his human rights work through the internet and in the United States while having the capacity to travel back and forth, engage, translate, and leverage. Or how about the International Criminal Court? I'm sometimes asked, um, you know, the United States is still not a party to the internet, to the Rome Treaty. But the fact of the matter is that the US position on the International Criminal Court under this administration is 180 degrees opposite of what it was, but no laws have been changed. So from Nuremberg, where the US supported international criminal justice, we reached an absurd situation where the US was supporting all ad hoc tribunals, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Lebanon, uh, Cambodia, Sierra Leone, but opposing the standing criminal tribunal, in fact, the official position of the last administration was to destroy the court, even though there are 113 parties. And it was very clear that we couldn't either ratify the treaty, we didn't have the votes for that, nor could we repeal the Hague Service Members, the American Service Members Protection Act. 
In the first meeting we had on this, uh, our team concluded that we would try to turn the policy around without changing any laws. Through engage, go to all the meetings, translate, make it clear that in fact we didn't oppose the object and purpose of the treaty, and to come out in support of every ongoing case at the ICC, which is what the US has now done. So, we're no longer an opponent of the court. In fact, we're one of the big supporters of the court. The court faces major challenges. My son once said to me, what was this like? And I said, do you remember the time where we turned the car around inside the garage without opening the doors? <laughs> you know, it takes a lot of work. And part of it was to do it below the radar screen so people didn't see it. But that's uh, the outcome. How about this one? Uh, this is one of the most interesting ones to me. One of the technological changes is the creation of what are called assisted reproductive technologies. So how about this? A lesbian couple lives in a foreign country. One of the members of the lesbian couple is American. Um, implanted into her body <coughs> is a fertilized egg where neither the egg nor the sperm are American from American citizens. But she carries that baby to term for nine months and delivers it in a foreign country. Is that baby an American citizen who had an American mother? Now, it turns out that the immigration laws say that the child must have a natural relationship with their parent. And this had been construed to mean a genetic relationship. Well, this woman has no genetic relationship to this baby who she birthed through her own birth canal. So we reinterpret it to mean natural means genetic or gestational. This struck me as a reasonable translation exercise. It's highly controversial, still being debated within the government. But guess what, guys? The framers of these laws did not think about this issue. And if you want to know something else I didn't think about, it's the human rights of clones, which I think is the huge human rights issue to come. I don't know how many of you were birthed through assisted reproductive technologies. I don't know if any of you is a clone. <laughs> uh, you laugh. Maybe every one of us could be cloned so that we have a body there that has our spare parts. Does that entity have human rights? Are they born human? Can everybody have their, you know, um, body part cloned? Um, should those people be relegated to an inferior status, just like illegitimates and people of different sexual orientations or people of different physical characteristics? Are we going to wait to decide these questions until there are many clones among us? Uh, will people have to cover um, and pass? as non-clones, right? That's the Gattaca scenario. Who has a right to challenge cloning or the use of clones? It's a gigantic set of issues in which there's been little or no legal work done. Well, I'm going to do some of it now. What about cyberspace? This is big and hot out here in Silicon Valley. There are at least four important faces. Internet freedom, intellectual property, and piracy e-commerce and cyber war. Notice that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights presciently speaks of the right to seek, receive, and impart information ideas through any media and regardless of uh, frontiers, as if they were thinking about the internet back in 1948. Let me just talk about cyber conflict. Um, the United States has rules of cyber conflict, which until recently were not publicized. So I push very hard to publicize them. Partly because a number of other governments, particularly the Chinese, were saying there is no law in cyberspace. It's a black hole. So through the group of governmental experts and the so-called WICKET, World Conference on International Telecommunications, we tried to translate the laws of war to cyberspace and to try to leverage it into a series of standard-setting exercises led by something called the Tallinn Manual. And now we have an emerging body of cyber conflict law. Or how about private security contractors? You know, guess, guess what? Most soldiers don't, aren't enlisted. There are people like um, Arnold Schwarzenegger and um, 
you know, uh, all, the, the expendables, as we call them, right? <laughs> Uh, are those people bound by human rights norms? They don't work for governments, except on a contract basis. Engage, we created a set of principles called the Montreux document. We translate it into a code of conduct that affects 500 plus companies. We leverage it through private contractors to internalize these norms into contractor behavior. And the whole theory of internalization is something that's very much a part of my own academic work. Norm internalization is a way to bring international law home. Which brings us to Arab Awakening. When we were watching Arab Awakening play out in all the countries listed at the bottom of the screen, Secretary Clinton said to me, you know, there's one good piece of information here. And I said, what's that? And she said, you know, most of these people do not want to join Al-Qaeda. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't people who do want to join Al-Qaeda, but many of them would rather exercise their voice in their own country, which have been the subject of authoritarian control for many years. So the strategy is not drones. The strategy is smart power. She gave this speech on September 11th, 2011, which happened to be the same day as Benghazi. Use force for limited purposes within a broader framework that uses smart power, diplomacy, development, education, people-to-people -people outreach, challenge the ideology, prevent people from joining. But there's a hardcore group of Al-Qaeda leaders who basically are unavailable through these means and are not likely to suddenly become peaceful. Now, these group of people do not have political ambitions. We're not talking about the Irish Republican Army here. We're talking about, or Sinn Féin, we're talking about people whose sworn mission is to kill civilians. So let me give you this thought experiment. Suppose on September 18th, the day that Congress passed the AUMF against Al-Qaeda, the Authorization for Use of Military Force, the winner of the popular vote, Al Gore, came out. And he says the following. Seven days ago, 3,000 innocent civilians were killed in what is a grotesque human rights violation. It was done by a non-state actor that uses military tools. Um, I have to prevent this from happening again. And Congress has today declared war on that network. Let me tell you what I will not do. I will not do anything stupid. I will not, say, invade Iraq. I will not torture anybody. I will not form military commissions. I will not do extraordinary rendition. I will not engage in massive, overbroad surveillance. That hurts our legitimacy and weakens our smart power and our claim to use international law as a force on our side. But here is what I must do. I must target the leadership of Al Qaeda. If I find them in Tora Bora, I will try to arrest them. If that is not possible, I will use every technological method at my disposal, including drones, be it one or a dozen, to end the war. I need your support. I will do this transparently. I'll do it in accordance with international standards. And I will consult broadly with our allies, Congress, and the media. Now, if he had said that, people would say, that's what he's got to do. Why do I say this? Because obviously, the problem is not drones. They are a tool. They're not the strategy. The mistake was, first, doing all the things he said he wouldn't do, and then Obama not doing all the things he originally promised to do. Until finally, the group of hardcore Al-Qaeda people is so dispersed that people start to see the drone problem as another version of all the other problems that they got used to seeing in the last administration. So <coughs> the real strategy is engage translate and leverage with drones as a tool and a piece of this strategy. Now, it took the president a long time to get there, but in May, he gave a speech at the National Defense University where he essentially very explicitly adopted the smart power framework. He said, we have to define the nature and scope of the struggle or it'll define us. We're not talking about a global perpetual war on terror. We should repeal the AUMF, but drones can be an effective discriminate tool to help dismantle specific terrorist networks. So what are the differences? 
There's no claim of a global war on terror or a black hole. There's an insistence on humane treatment. And most fundamentally, that the focus on particular al-Qaeda leaders is fact-based. They're not just called enemy combatants. And I say this with great sadness, as uh, people who know me know, I knew, knew the name of all my students. For four years, it was my fate to know the name of every significant al-Qaeda leader and everything about them. I memorized uh, their resumes and their life stories. One guy was born on the same day as my daughter, the same day. And when I reviewed his history, on the day that my daughter went to the prom, he killed somebody. On the day that my daughter entered college, he launched a suicide attack that killed 15 people. So this is not labeling of a guy as an enemy combatant. He is a senior member of a group against whom war was declared consistent with domestic and international law. That's what I call a fact as opposed to a label-based approach. Now, I think there are four issues going forward, transparency, consultation, standard setting, and ending the war. Transparency, I think the administration has been weak, but they're getting closer. Consultation, I think they've been weak. Standard setting, the administration has now announced a set of drone standards, which it ought to multilateralize. And most fundamentally, and this is an issue being debated now much in the blog, the question is, who is al-Qaeda? For example, is um, ISIS in uh, Iraq, the group that's just taken Fallujah, are they or are they not part of the original Al-Qaeda? My suggestion here is we all know the difference between the Beatles and Beatle imitators. <laughs> we declared war on the Beatles. We didn't declare war on Beatle imitators. The guys, Sarnayev and Boston Massacre, they're homegrown self-radicalizers. Do they imitate the most successful terrorists around the Al-Qaeda, of course? But are they subject to the command and control of Zawahiri? Certainly not. So we have to be very careful about defining who is the enemy so that we don't have a perpetual war which creates a new normal. The smart power approach is to end three wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Al-Qaeda, the general strategy is declining military engagement, enhanced diplomatic engagement, continuing civilian engagement, and developing of civil society. And a whole set of legal initiatives are at stake to achieve these outcomes. Now, I'll tell you that none of these are particularly rosy at the moment. Afghanistan, we're waiting for the conclusion of the bilateral security agreement. Iraq violence is renewing. Al-Qaeda and the resurgence of a number of Al-Qaeda groups. But the one that has to be won is the battle with Al-Qaeda because they are the ones who would come and attack US soil. You could, uh, let me be blunt about this, you can say we've won or ended the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and most of the violence goes on there. But if you don't actually eliminate the core of Al-Qaeda, you're looking for another attack on US soil and people have a hard time explaining why that happened when supposedly Al-Qaeda was defeated. How about closing Guantanamo? I could say more about this. Uh, I suggested a series of steps. The goal originally was to get 29 people out by the end of 2013. They got out 11. Uh, as you've seen recently in a series of announcements, progress is finally being made on this issue. And my guess is that the core of this is a negotiation with the Yemenis, which I think will achieve this outcome probably at the very, very end of the Obama administration. So what about humanitarian intervention, the very last issue? Libya, example number one. People think of Libya as a hard power operation. It was a smart power operation. Engage, translate, and leverage. The US military piece was a no-fly zone and an arms embargo, which I believe did not constitute hostilities for purposes of the war powers resolution. But among other things, there was assets freeze, diplomacy, a travel ban, ICC accountability, and while Libya is not a perfect situation, see Benghazi and Ansar al-Sharia, um, thousands of lives were saved there. So what happened with Syria? Well, the effort again was it's a smart power approach with a very broad set of objectives, but the primary tools being used were diplomacy. <coughs> the problems there were a consistent 
a persistent Russian veto because there was no resolution. This made it difficult to threaten multilateral force. There were broad objectives, secure chemical weapons, get a ceasefire, oust Assad, get humanitarian aid and secure accountability. But the objectives could not be achieved by the soft power tools alone, which led Obama to take a position last summer where he said, if there is an undisputed use of chemical weapons, it crosses the red line, and I'll use force unilaterally if necessary. Now, there's a right-left coalition, including from many from the academy, attacking him. I don't think Obama was wrong on principle. I think what we've seen is the difficulty Obama has writ large. He's better on principle than he is on the politics to achieve the principle. But interestingly, his threat of force uh, led to this interesting conundrum. Because US power, the approach was all soft power. Suddenly, Obama threatens hard power. People were saying it was illegal. It turned the focus into our conduct, not Assad's conduct. It called into question an engaged, translate, and leverage strategy. It sounded like unilateralism, black hole, going alone. There was widespread opposition. And then, this is really one of the most disgusting things. Suddenly, Vladimir Putin, Mr. Human Rights, <laughs> Mr. International Law, as we approach Sochi, is writing this pathetic op-ed. Uh, we must stop using the language of force and return to the path of civilized, diplomatic, and political settlement. In other words, I am the soft power guy. I mean, we are the ones who care about international law and uh, order out of balance. But here's what happened. The threat of force provided the critical element to go with the other soft power pieces. It motivated the diplomacy, the administration's approach then mutated back to engage, translate, and leverage. And we are now in a situation where chemical weapons are being destroyed, and the Organization for the uh, uh, Prevent the Proliferation of Chemical Weapons has won the Nobel Peace Prize. So in closing, do we have a strategy to help us meet these problems? Yes. Uh, I think it's engage, translate, and leverage. A final point is this, are academic theories relevant? Well, a lot of my writing has been about two subjects, transnational legal process, norm internalization, and then a speech I gave here at Stanford back in 2003. The role of positive US exceptionalism in mobilizing transnational legal process to achieve certain results. Which means that we need a process where the US, through its engagement, um, creates interactions that creates interpretations that internalize norms into bureaucratic dialogue. Well, you see the similarity. Inter interaction, interpretation, internalization, my academic approach, is the same thing as engage, translate, and leverage. Interaction is engagement, interpretation is translation, leverage is a way to try to get internalization. My point is this, this approach is not just a political strategy of an administration. It's a way to test an academic theory to the real world. It's a way to try to update 20th century law to address 21st century realities. It's part of a book I'm writing on law and globalization, uh, the Clarendon Law Lectures, which I'll be giving in Oxford in the coming spring. I encourage you to buy it in hardback, Oxford University Press. <laughs> <laughs> These are very expensive books, uh, but that's OK. Uh, you can afford it, and my children will thank you. <laughs> Let me stop there. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much for being here. I actually was an uh, international relations student as an undergraduate and I've read your articles, not all 180 of them, but some of them, so it's really great to have the opportunity to ask you a question in person. You know, I was thinking about, and the slide you presented with uh, Putin's op-ed sort of crystallized the question for me. Sometimes I wonder whether international law is really just a, another forum for power politics to play out. Do you think that there is a risk, perhaps as an, a scholar of international law, of, of identifying international legal solutions or the, the force of international law in certain situations where in fact it's just another playground for uh, the realpolitik to play out and is there a way 
in designing international legal institutions to prevent that from happening? Yeah, I mean, so one of the great ironies of the 70s and 80s is that both the far right, the political realists in the Cold War, and the far left in the legal academy, the critical legal studies movement, both thought that law is a mask for power and that there are no neutral principles of law or uh, law as autonomous discipline uh, is a joke. Everything's ultimately malleable. Now, I don't believe that. Um, law and I believe in legal realism, but that suggests that there are certain principles that are not uh, malleable in that way. On the other hand, the world evolved. The U.S. is a player in the making of international law, and that's a piece of the picture also. So it's very important to me that if the United States argues for a principled position on humanitarian intervention, that they're not just creating a mask for a war of aggression. But it seems to me that in your heart, you know there's a difference between what you would consider to be aggression and what you would consider to be humanitarian intervention. Um, on chemical weapons, I think what got lost in the Obama discussion is, you know, we, the use of chemical weapons on a broad scale offensively had essentially been eliminated. If you're a person who follows public health, it's like the elimination of polio. Are you really going to have countries deliberately and on a broad scale unleashing chemical weapons at children and nobody doing anything about it? And have the guy that's doing it or allowing it to happen, Vladimir Putin, start talking about international law? I mean, it's just a sham. Now, that means that the creative energies have to go into the creation of better legal rules that don't let the exception swallow the rule. Now, it's very interesting. I wrote about this in the blog, Just Security. And I, and I was very struck. A lot of people, international lawyers, said, well, the use of force for humanitarian intervention it could be illegitimate but illegal. Why don't you say it's illegitimate but illegal? And I said, yeah, yeah, like uh, the women's equality movement after Frontiero versus Richardson. They don't, they don't get strict scrutiny. So I guess that the, the, the struggle for legal equality for women is uh, legitimate but illegal. We'll, we'll let it sit there. Or how about this? Uh, uh, civil unions exist, so why do we push for the legalization of same-sex marriage? Let's just say that people living in same-sex marriage are doing something that's illegitimate but legal. Well, guess what? You go to a great law school where part of the theory is that you are not just law takers, you are law changers, and that you devote your life to making better rules. I mean, take any subject that you studied in law school, you know, torts, affirmative defenses for duress, or criminal law, the battered woman's defense. You know, there are ways in which established per se rules can be adjusted to take account of particular equities or exigencies. That's a law making exercise, you know, strict liability and tort. So you can have a new set of rules. The law is not immutable. But there are limits to how much the law can be twisted to serve particular political ends. And you do have to think, as you're engaging this lawmaking process, um, whether you're creating a set of rules that are going to be abused by others, right? Um, I was you know, supremely uh, aware of that. You know, so for example, Obama announced a set of rules on the use of drones, which it requires near certainty that there are no civilians present. Near certainty, that's a very high standard. As lawyers, we understand that's a high standard. So I'm at a thing, and somebody says to me, well, look, there's this uh, wedding party in Yemen where all the people got killed, so obviously they're not applying the standard. I, I don't know what the answer is. That's obviously something to be addressed, but we know what the standard is. We know what Obama said the rule was. Was the rule followed in this case? You can have a debate over that, a factual and legal debate. That's what we do as lawyers. It makes it, do I think he set forth the right legal test? Yes. Are legal rules often misapplied in particular circumstances? Yes. So anyway, um, 
I would urge you not to surrender the notion that law has integrity, but also having integrity doesn't mean it's immutable. And by the way, the goal is not just to follow the law. The goal is to follow the law to achieve good outcomes that are respectful of human rights and human dignity. And people sometimes lose pieces of that. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. <clears throat> so uh, one thing, uh, my name is uh, Matthew Hartog. Um, we're listening to the telephone calls of three billion people on Earth. That's illegal searches and seizures. In addition to that, we're doing this to our closest allies, like Angela Merkel. And we didn't even give her a heads up that we were doing it. I, I, do, I don't think that's smart power. The other thing is, um, in Egypt, you know, uh, we're letting a uh, military uh, junta uh, Im impose a, as bad a, of a dictatorship as what came before. We gave no support to uh, Mr. Morsi. Again, that's a problem. Uh, okay, the third question is, uh, Stanford has a, an endowment of $18 billion. How much is it going to cost us to, to knock Yale Law off the top spot after 50 years? Well, the last one's easy, never. Uh, probably <laughs> not. Although, never, right? Now, you can be the best on the West Coast. That's great. Yeah, I, <laughs> you know, um, I, on the other two, look, um, so I am not a big fan of military juntas or military governments. You know, such a government overthrew the democratic government in Korea that my father was a part of. But let's not pretend that Morsi was a good leader. He was terrible. The very people who demonstrated for the overthrow of uh, Mubarak found that conditions under Morsi were worse than ever. They thought the Muslim Brotherhood was a terrible leadership. And frankly, what happened was they had the elections too early and they got elected. They elected the people who they didn't have any confidence actually would carry out democratic goals. <laughs> So Egypt is in a very tumultuous state at the moment. I spent a fair amount of time there. Um, but I don't think it's open and shut. Um, in countries, there are many countries where the military turns out to be the only stable institution. And then the question is, how do you build a representative government around it? It's not easy. I think we're a long way from an outcome in Egypt. But I think just saying, what, put Morsi back and you know, remove the military from the governments of the country is not this, not going to be a stable solution either. I don't think this is necessarily a legal issue per se. I think it's more of a policy question. Uh, the NSA surveillance issues is a little bit more complicated than people give credit for. So I say a number of things. First, l let's be face it. I mean, does Angela Merkel know that she's being listened to? I, I think so. I mean, if you're the leader of a great country, do you say important things on a cell phone call? I don't think so. <laughs> Were they trying to get the US for something? Yeah, they did. <coughs> but let's not kid ourselves. Number two, there is a disparity between the way we talk about technological capacity, right? The same people who are unbelievably threatened by the NSA's omnipotence consider everybody who's doing the website at healthcare.gov as totally incompetent, <laughs> right? So guess what? The truth lies somewhere in between. Third, um, you say it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. I don't know what it is. It will be determined <coughs> through a series of cases. Last time I checked, the Fourth Amendment standard, Katz versus the United States, reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, what's your expectation of privacy in a world of GPS? Um, you know, you guys turn on your own locate my iPhone, and then you say a reasonable expectation of privacy and where you are, you have affected your own reasonable expectation of privacy by the way you behave. Another point to be made is that when we're talking about metadata, we're talking about what I find amazing. is like the, the very same people who watched the movie, The Born Legacy or The Born Identity or whatever The Born is, <laughs> where Matt Damon is tracking some call from some guy in Tangier and they're like making these links. And so they figure out that this guy here called this guy, we call this guy. That's what you do when you track metadata. 
and what a comprehensive assembly of material is doing is allowing you not to have gaps in that array, even though you're not listening to any of the calls. So the, the base has been gathered. So to my perspective, it was not unexpected that this kind of material be gathered. So that's the defense of parts of it. What's the other side of it? Obviously, the NSA gathered way more information than they needed. They did things in a very non-transparent fashion. They had very few people arguing for the Fourth Amendment rights of individuals. Um, their technological capacities exceeded their capacities for taking human rights considerations into account. <coughs> so the special panel that includes people like Jeff Stone and Cass Sunstein have recommended you know, 46 recommendations. Obviously, some of those should be adopted. Um, do I think Edward Snowden is a hero? No. I don't think he deserved to have access to classified information. I mean, he, he gave away millions and millions of secrets that he took oath to not give away. And then, you know, civil disobedience usually means you, you face the music and make your defense in a proceeding. So I, I, I just thought it's, it's an amazing thing. Julian Assange in WikiLeaks did not care if human rights activists in countries whose cables he released would be killed the next day because he wanted to release the information. And millions and millions and millions of dollars and person hours were spent getting people who he had put at risk callously to safety. And there is no well-publicized event of someone having been harmed as a result of his blatant releases to which Julian Assange responded, see, I didn't do anything wrong. Well, you know, um, just because material is overclassified doesn't mean the antidote is gross releases. Finally, and it should be pretty obvious, there's something wrong with the classification system where a 20-year-old private with mental issues, like now Chelsea Manning, or a guy like Edward Snowden has access to so much material which the Deputy Secretary of State doesn't have access to. So something is obviously wrong. It, it requires a very comprehensive look. So here's the dilemma, right? Wouldn't it be nice if we had an Attorney General like Ed Levy and a head of the Judiciary Committee like uh, Teddy Kennedy, and they spend 18 months reforming the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and have hearings in which all groups are represented and pass very intelligent laws that will hold it up for another 40 years? We're not in that environment. So we're going to have to make various kinds of adjustments. The way in which our political dysfunction is killing us and hurting us is profound. So all of this is to say, um, you know, these are complex questions, and we have to understand all the complexities of them. Um, we live too much in a world of gotcha and not enough a, in a world of how to make the world better without making the world worse. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, letting the, the crisis in Syria metastasize was not a good strategy. Um, so the first group of people to be blamed are the Russians and the Chinese who veto four consecutive resolutions, which makes military force through a multilateral process in the UN difficult, impossible. 
unless you're ready to take on the humanitarian intervention or chemical weapons question. Uh, I think the, the further question, though, is um, if, if Obama was going to draw a red line, he should make it clear it's not his personal red line. It's the world's red line. Right? The lesson we should have learned from 9-11 is when you attack uh, capital and kill 3,000 civilians, that's an attack, you know, where the UN is, that's an attack on the world. It's not just an attack on the United States. So his job was to multilateralize this issue. And, you know, they knew for months that a chemical attack was possible. The message they should have sent is, this is not just a, uh, we're going to have to draw a red line here and get Congress to support action, the people to support the action, and the allies to support, support the action. But because so many other things are going on, he just said in an interview, it's my red line, or something like that. And then at the exact moment it comes up, which is at the end of August when everyone's going off on vacation, you know, there was no grassroots support. You know, where were all the people who were calling for action, like McCain and Graham, and wh why weren't they lined up to say, we back this? Why weren't all the allies lined up? And then you had the Brits mishandling the parliamentary vote. So inaction, I think, went on too long different kind of proactive action was uh, indicated earlier. Uh, you know, we don't live in a perfect world. People don't do everything right. Um, it's easier to be criticized looking back than it is to do it right going forward. But we all learn lessons. 